technology panelists with us here today. First, we have Serena Higgins, who will be talking about handle, how to handle the hollows, editing a 100-year-old play for the 21st century. She is a writer, English teacher, and inkling scholar. She's not Danish nor related to Kierkegaard, but added a slashed O to her name to look more sexy. <laughs> she serves as a preceptor at Sigmund University and teaches English at Leigh Carbon Community College. She's working on two books about Charles William, an edition of his play, The Chapel of Thorn, with Apocryphal Press, and an academic collection entitled The Inklings and King Arthur. She also writes the blog, The Oddest Inkling. Serena and her husband designed and built their own house without experience or expertise, and it hasn't uh, fallen down around them yet. So I'm sure that Diane will be wanting to ask you for decorations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's so great to be here with all of you. I'm going to talk to you about how to handle the hallows, editing a 100-year-old play for the 21st century. So here's the play, um, The Chapel of the Thorn. It's for sale in the marketplace. I'll be sure to get a copy of this beautiful book. So it's a play by Charles Williams that I edited. It includes a preface and an essay by two other Charles Williams scholars and notes. So it's a, it's a great book with some good materials in it. I want to talk to you about it today. On June the 8th, 2012, I held in my hands a 100-year-old manuscript. No one else had touched it since it had been deposited in the archives of the Marion Wade Center in Wheaton, Illinois, in 1973. So it was The Chapel of the Thorn, a two-act verse drama by Charles Williams, the other inkling, with C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. He was a member of the Inklings from 1939 until his death in 1945. This little drama is among the earliest of Charles Williams' works. He wrote it in 1912, but it had never before been published until this year. But even though it was such an early work, it deals with a topic that resonates through all of his writings in his entire life, which is how to handle a sacred relic, or more metaphorically, how to respond to spiritual realities. So in this way, the Chapel of the Thorn, we could say, is out of this world, because it's dealing with the supernatural, and yet it's also a locus of traditional Christian approaches to fantasy, and more specifically to matters on the edge of Arthurian legend. And so that's how it ties into the larger themes of this conference. So I'm going to talk to you about how the Crown of Thorns functions in this play, and how this theme functions a little bit more broadly in William's works, and then the content of the play as well. So the crown of thorns in this play is a sort of metonym for the holy grail. And just in case we're not up on metonym, so two figures of speech here, metonym and synecdoche. So a metonym is a figure of speech in which you, in which you refer to something related to the object that you want to mention. So if you said, the White House issued a statement this morning, right? The House didn't speak and issue a statement, but it's related to the person who gave it. Who, probably himself is also a metonym for the president, right? The press secretary is also a metonym. Um, if you say the crown issued a decree, right? Similarly, the crown is an object uh, related to the person in question. So how is the crown of thorns a metonym for the holy grail? And why does that, why does that matter? Well, because it's a hallow. A hallow is any physical object that is traditionally associated with Jesus' crucifixion or the whole Passion Week. So any of the items that were used at the Last Supper, the cup, the plate, and so forth, are hallows or any items relating to the crucifixion. The crown of thorns, the nails, pieces of the true cross. So these are all venerated <clears throat> as sacred relics throughout the Middle Ages, and they're specifically called hallows as opposed to other relics, like a saint's pinky finger bone or something like that. Um, so, the crown of thorns is a hallow, but the grail has traditionally been seen as the most important one. The cup, sometimes the plate, but more traditionally the cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper, and then in some accounts was used to catch his blood from the cross. So it's seen as being the most important and central hallow. So when Williams refers to the crown of thorns here, he's really evoking all of those items, and then in turn those items were all evoking the gospel itself, the salvation story, which to Williams is the center of his life and of Christian history and of humanity. So you see how this small object is serving as metonym for everything else. 
Now, the Holy Grail is also associated with the Arthurian story as well. In many of the, especially later French versions of the Arthurian story, the knights go on a quest to achieve the Holy Grail. And there, too, it's also symbolic of spiritual reality. And the Arthurian story was central in Charles William's life. He took this as the tale onto which he mapped all of his writings, but also, interestingly, his personal life. He chose nicknames for himself and all of his friends and family and associates that were somewhat tangentially related to his own version of the Arthurian legends, and he required his uh, friends and family and associates to enact roles that matched these characters that he assigned them. Um, and throughout all of his life, he tried to write the Arthurian story in different ways, in different genres, until his two great masterful volumes of poetry towards the end of his life. Taliesin through Logres in 1938, and The Region of the Summer Stars in 1944. So he saw the Holy Grail as central to the Arthurian story for the reasons that I just said. And the Holy Grail in its turn is a synecdoche for all of those other objects. So synecdoche here is a part for the whole, right? So that one object um, representing the whole all the objects and actions of Christ's passion and all the characters' responses to these physical items are revelatory of their eternal salvific or damnatory condition. Um, so that's why they're so important. So how to handle the hallows for Charles Williams is perhaps the most important lesson because it reveals your eternal spiritual condition. This is also related to his idea of putting yourself in service to your role and to the position that you've been given. In his late Arthurian cycle, there's a line when King Arthur has just been crowned and he's standing and looking out at his people and his castle and his kingdom. And the question is asked in the poem, the kingdom for the king or the king for the kingdom? So you see what he's asking there. Which one is going to serve the other? Is Arthur going to use everything he's gained to serve himself? Or is he going to subordinate himself to his role and serve the kingdom? And unfortunately, he chooses that the kingdom will serve him, and that's one of many sins. That's the downfall of the kingdom. So th that's the uh, larger background in which this play uh, participates. So now I'm going to talk more specifically about the Chapel of the Thorn and its themes and content, and uh, then well, how it's still relevant. So the story of the Chapel of the Thorn is that there is a chapel in an unnamed location on the coast, but it seems pretty clear that's probably the southeast of England. There's a little chapel where either the whole crown of thorns or a piece of it is kept as a sacred relic. And there are three groups that are contending with each other for control of this location and this relic. The first is the local priest, Joachim, who has served here in this chapel for years. And so his motivations are twofold. One, to keep the crown of thorns there in the chapel so that he has control over it. And two, he's, he preaches a doctrine of love and freedom. And that's his goal, is to be able to keep preaching this doctrine to the villagers. The second person and group who are contending for the crown of thorns is the local abbot, Innocent. So he lives a couple miles down the road at the abbey, and he wants to take the crown of thorns out of the chapel and move it to the abbey, because then he thinks he'll get more pilgrims and more tithes and more glory. And his spiritual goal is that he teaches law and legalism, salvation through law. So their theologies are opposed. Then there's a third group, and this is the pagan priest Amael. It's sort of a druidic religion. And they want control of the site because their folk hero, Druhild, is buried underneath the chapel. So they all pretend to be Christians and go to church and participate in all the Christian rituals. And in their hearts, they're worshiping Druhild instead of Jesus. And so they want the crown of thorns to stay there as well, so they, and they want to have access to the site. As often happens in Charles Williams' dramas, it's a metaphysical drama. It's a spiritual conflict. So there's not a whole lot of what you would consider external action. Um, but it's still very vivid and very lively. The characters' motivations are very clear. and There's a lot of conflict among them. And there's also a startlingly, startlingly strong sympathy for the non-Christian perspective throughout this drama for an Anglican writer. Those three who are contending seem to be very equally balanced throughout the play. And as a matter of fact, the pagan priest is given the most beautiful poetry. The play ends with a threefold anthem in which the priests are chanting Christian texts in Latin, and Amael and the villagers are singing a ballad and a folk song about Druhild. So it's really hard to tell who wins in the end. Now we know who has control of the crown of thorns at the end. I won't tell you. It's by the book. Um, but we don't know. We don't know where the sympathies of the play lie. We don't know where Charles Williams' sympathies lie and where the audience's sympathies are supposed to lie. A director could choose to stage it in such a way that that were clear, 
perhaps by having one song continue longer than the others so that one song had the last word, or by the physical setup. But then there's also one character, an unnamed woman, the only female character in the play, who gets just about a half a dozen of lines, and she gets the actual last line of the play, in which she prays to the Virgin Mary to thank her for healing her son of an illness. So that's the actual last line. So it might seem perhaps she gets the last word of the play, but we don't know whether the other characters are still singing. Is the pagan folk song still going on? Um, so it's the overwhelming sense of the ending is indeterminate, that nobody wins or everybody wins. So we don't know whether Williams is advocating unfettered freedom or paganism or legalism or one character chooses to withdraw from the world and become a hermit. The text does not allow any of these interpretations, or rather it allows all of them simultaneously in a kind of indeterminate pluralism. Okay, but there's another question then. Is it any good? <laughs> this early, you know, 1912 play, Williams didn't really come into his, uh, into his strength as a poet and a dramatist until the mid-30s. So what about this early play? Is the poetry any good? Is it a good drama? Could it be performed? And I'm happy to, per to report to you that the answer is yes. On March 17th, 2014, St. Patrick's Day, eight members of my local artists um, and writers fellowship gathered and we read the entire play out loud. Each person took one of the major characters and some of the small roles and we read it in a semi-staged fashion. We made an audio recording of it and it's really good. Uh, the poetry is beautiful. So even purely as lyric poetry, it has value there. But the characters are very engaging and they have emotional depth and there is real conflict and compelling drama and an exciting narrative arc. And um, most of the members of this group were also members of a local theater company and the director of the theater company was there and she said she could imagine mounting a production of this at some point. Right now she works with teenagers and kids, so maybe, maybe not now. Um, but she could imagine it being performed. It also requires only a small cast, minimal sets, and limited technical magic, so it could be a practical choice for a small theater to perform. So if you know anybody who has a small theater who would be interested in mounting a production of this, let me know. We can work with the estate. Um, so I'm briefly going to talk to you about some themes in the play, but first, we're going to hear a dramatic reading selection from the play. So, Corey and Dave and Ed have very kindly offered to come up and read the three main characters. This, this is an imaginary selection. I've cut and pasted some like favorite bits. So this exact series does not occur anywhere in the play. Um, Shocking. I'm the only one with paper. That's really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Um, that's right. You're so backward in those ways. <laughs> so, Ed, excuse me, Ed is Amiel the pagan priest. Um, Dave is Joachim, the, ch the um, priest of the local chapel who has the crown of thorns now. And Corey is Innocent, the abbot uh, who wants to take it and bring it to the abbey. All right, let's hear it. Ha! Earrings, and a gold earrings of gold and a sword. A harp player. Are the old evils loose again? Who are thou, fellow? I am a little dust, blown from the ruined temples of the gods. Art thou baptized? I, with a baptize, baptism that ye not know of. Have you no need to be baptized of me? Thy gods were gods of that west country king, and he himself is gone to his gods in hell. Long shall no will prevail against my gods, hunger and thirst of every sort. A fire lit in the lustihood of flesh shall burn all but the very fire itself. Albeit for a little while can ye make men afraid. Let rather men be bold to sin than be o'erruled by terror. Naught is any worth if ye destroy a man's heart in his breast, or change to fear his valiancy of soul. Twice hath my hand lain over mortal eyes, while with the incantation of the fire I struck forth human blood upon the stone. O oh, slayer of Christ! O oh, Christ, surf, take and slay! I have the power to slay, and to release have power. Slay then. I die, but the strong gods remain. Abbot, though but one man were left, one saint, there should be a thirst and hunger. There should the gods have prayer and service. Yea, though all men perish, if wild beasts remain, then the gods rend with hunger and abide. Brother, thy gods are diverse. God is one. Yet where one beast, one stone is, God is there. There is not of matter or spirit, but is God. Yea, all man's being, save his will, is God. Lo, thine ally in, ally in freedom, York. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
as me. <laughs> I knew when I blessed the cup once that I held tossing within the rim of within the circle of the rim, in a vision of sound, all sounds that ever were. A high priest calling on a multitude and beat of heavy hammers, hammers upon nails. Where he is, all creation is. Reach forth thy hand to the maker of the world. Ha, Joachim, death is already on thy God. His hands pluck at his itch of leprosy. His eyes are horrid with the fear of time to come. O Christ, O Christ, thou art broken, O white Christ. See to it. In three days' time, get thee hence. Go. Fear not, I go. Yet would I run before thee through the land, at, at some secret pool fill one brimming cup, which when I come to die I may, I may in sacrifice pour out on earth, say, with this water which no Christ has left, do I, their priest, salute the immortal gods. <laughs> <laughs> Set out thine accusation. Stand and speak. What sayest thou of me, thou Joachim? That thou hast found in traffic through the world, the riches of Christ's blood are vendible. Religion hast thou made a fair for kings. Wilt thou that each man should form an aim or creed, a doctrine and a law? Is not each man a new world before God? Which in the will and strength of God, the law toward others hath control and is controlled. Man shall never find, except through his own strength of love. Nay, by law only shall men find out love. Thy church is but in censors, altar lights. Oh, and then it continues on the next page. <laughs> <laughs> the perils of technology. <laughs> Coming and going from confessional. How should I yield the thorn up to such thought? Who have beheld the holy bride, the church, caught to her mystic marriage through the world, wed to her lover in all mortal things? This is the church, this is salvation, this. And will ye make it sure to men by law? Blessed thy soul is that hath seen these things. Yet I too have borne much penance, fasted long, seen visions and dreamed dreams. And how should these things be except by law? Save a man's will be gained, his life is not. Nay, by life only shall a man's will learn, in which cause therefore I demand again, will thou yield up to me this crown of thorn? No. Thou hast mine answer, do thy will. There goes a greater man than we. Rebel he is, and heretic perchance. <laughs> Yet knoweth him with all the saints may climb high pads, and breathe the chill air of supernal thought. But we hold the bad, unrestful heart of common men. Therefore, the greater shall be overthrown, and the lesser man shall conquer. Even I. <laughs> wow, thank you, gentlemen. See, isn't that great? <laughs> so I'll just wrap up here for the sake of time. Um, so throughout the play, the crown of thorns is the catalyst that reveals the spiritual condition of each of these characters and of all the minor ones as well. It works kind of like the crime in a murder mystery, right? A murder is committed, and really the point of the story is that the way people respond to the crime reveals who they really are and what they're really like. And there's also there's one moment in the play when this becomes very, very clear. King Constantine appears, and if you want to know whether he's the historical Constantine, read my introduction. Um, he says, after he has uh, done what he thought was right in regard to the crown of thorns, he says, I shall be boasted over all kings because I have set Christ above all gods. So do you see what he's done there in that quote? I've done this great thing for Christ, and therefore I will be honored. So he's using Christ as a means to his own um, ambition and worldly advancement. And in William's mind, this is uh, the worst possible sin, using sacred items and obviously using Jesus himself as sort of a rung on a ladder for your worldly ambitions. And the play is startlingly relevant for our times and has ongoing relevance because it's also full of arguments about just war, about whether it's right to use physical force and violence to preserve the sacred hallow, and also about sacred and secular political power, about fundamentalism and radicalism and using these um, as political powers. So that sounds startlingly relevant. So really what I'm doing today is I'm just making an argument for a reading of the Inklings in the 21st century, even including some of their overlooked works. Thank you very much. I know that C.S. 
Lewis uh, start to have encountered T.S. Eliot's poetry and sort of rejected it or thought, you know, made fun of modernism. What was uh, William's reaction to some of this modern poetry going on? I know he's very much a traditionalist or dealing with very traditional themes, but. Yeah, he has an interesting line. He wrote, um, better to be modern than minor. <laughs> but he himself was quite minor and never very modern. Right. <laughs> Most of his literary criticism, as a matter of fact, seems to read like advice to himself, a lot of which he didn't take. Uh, <laughs> personally, he was much better friends with Eliot yeah. than Lewis. He, he considered um, Eliot one of the people who understood him best. Um, and he wrote a couple works of literary criticism about contemporary poetry. And he has a chapter on Eliot in um, English Poetic Mind. I'm not sure that's the right title. If it comes to me, I'll correct myself. There's a chapter about Eliot, and in the introduction he says, my apologies to Mr. Eliot, whose poetry I greatly admire but do not understand. <laughs> oh, and one other connection. They each wrote one of the plays for the Canterbury Festival, back to back, one year before the other. Um, what would be a good starting point for someone becoming familiar with Charles Williams? On my blog, The Oddest Inkling, I have a post called The Reader's Guide for Beginners. <laughs> so check that out. But it, it depends what genre you would like to read first, because like the other Inklings, he was very prolific in many genres, poetry, plays, novels, literary criticism, uh, theology. But if, if, like me and like many readers, you want to start with the novels, he has seven novels, and I would recommend starting with probably War in Heaven. It's the one that has something most resembling a plot. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for uh, Cheryl. That is, in this play that you talked to us about, it sounds like Charles Williams has a fairly balanced view between the Christian and the pagan. Um, is this typical of all of his works, and how does he compare to J.R.R. Tolkien in that respect? Right, yeah, fantastic question. Um, he does have a very balanced view in this play, and he does not tend to do that in later works in one sense. I mean, in his later works, he's got just explicit Christian theological works, and all of his novels have a very clear central character who is this sort of submitted saint, submitted there also God. However, um, he did believe in what Glenn Caballero calls absolute relativity, which is that um, <laughs> human... Yeah. Um, that human knowledge is only relative. So even though Williams himself might be completely convinced of something, might have a conviction on which he would stake his life, he believes that that's only within limited human knowledge. So he was also a skeptic, and he also believed that doubt was an essential part of faith, and so he would include that in his faith. Um, when he was young, he and his father would go on long walks together, and they would debate, and his dad would make him switch sides. So he would do that for the rest of his life. He would be debating with people, and he would suddenly switch sides the debate just to see how it would go. So this is integrated into his writings as well, that he has many other perspectives, perspectives integrated. In the novel Many Dimensions, um, Islam seems to be the religion that brings the salvation and saves the world from destruction and so forth. But also in the Chapel of the Thorn though, I speculate in my introduction that perhaps Williams himself was going through a phase of asking religious questions and um, he doesn't seem to have had any moment of dramatic conversion like Lewis, or of commitment like Tolkien, perhaps um, when Tolkien was a child. So he seems to have just sort of always held this faith and doubt simultaneously. But maybe at this time he was asking more questions about truth. Yeah. Uh, so he was 25. Yeah, he was a bit of a late bloomer. Yeah, he didn't get his style until he was in his 40s, really. Um, I should add to that answer as well, I don't know if you all know that he was in an occult secret society for 10 years as well, so this is also what makes him the oddest inkling, is that he's simultaneously <laughs> a committed Anglican and also a very active member. He was master of the temple for two six-month periods in this occult secret society, leading the services and all that, memorized all the rituals, and you can see its influence in even in his latest writings. Did you say these were consecutive or simultaneous? Simultaneous. Oh, wow. Yes. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and the title that I misspoke earlier is Poetry at Present. It has a chapter about T.S. Eliot, the Poetry at Present. Was Charles Green in the Golden Dawn? He was in an off 
offshoot of the Golden Dawn. A.E. Waite was um, in the Golden Dawn and broke off and started the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross. So that's what he was in. Yates was not involved in this one, but Williams did meet Yates and probably interacted with him. Yeah, excellent question. You'll find in many, many sources about Williams that it says he was a member of the Golden Dawn. He was not. As far as we know, it was a secret society. Um, yeah. <laughs> Williams himself said he was in the Golden Dawn, and there are reasons speculated about why he said that. Either he was, and we just still haven't found the evidence, or the Golden Dawn was slightly more prestigious than the Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, so he said that, or he was keeping his vows of secrecy. And he was just sort of naming a general umbrella. But also, he hated schisms. Uh, he wrote the East-West schism of the church out of his history of Christendom. So maybe he believed that Fellowship of the Rosy Cross was the real you know, heir to the Golden Dawn. Those possible reasons. Which, which church, sorry, I missed which church did he write the schisms out of? Uh, the whole history of Christendom. Oh, he history. got rid of the East-West, the 1053 That's split. Yeah. <laughs> and he unifies the Roman and Byzantine empires in his imagined history as well. I have another question for Cheryl. Maybe